All right, in this video, we're going to take a look at some specific aspects of human evolution as they pertain to me and you and the whole entire world. First of all, how do we know how old everything is, how old we are, all the things that are around us? It turns out that rocks and fossils can be dated. How you doing? <laughs> Just kidding. We use things called radioisotopes. So you might have heard of something called carbon dating, and you can use other things like potassium as well, potassium dating. That's fantastic. Uh, let's take a look at a few of the things here. It turns out that these various isotopes, taking carbon for example, carbon-14, the carbon-14 isotope, what will happen is naturally over time it will lose some of its radioactivity and the rate at which it loses its, its radioactivity is a set amount of time and because we know that, because we can calculate it, we can actually study and take a look at a sample and see how much radioactivity is left in that sample even though it's a very small amount, we can still measure it very accurately and find out when the last time that thing actually took in carbon as part of a metabolic process and we can calculate how old that thing is basically. Um, so if we're looking at things that are less than 10,000 years old or something like that, then carbon would be the best thing to use. Carbon dating has a half-life of 5,700 years. The half-life is the time taken for the radioactivity to fall to half of its original level. And you can see as a result of that relationship having every set amount of time, notice this is a constant uh, length here one, let's say it's a centimeter, that's one centimeter, two centimeter, three centimeters, four centimeters. Every given unit of time, the amount of radioactivity drops by 50%, boom. And then it drops to 50% of that value, then 50% of that value, then 50% of that value, and so on and so forth. So it has a kind of a logarithmic relationship. It's not a straight line proportional relationship. So this is really easy to understand and do all kinds of calculations from. You need to practice this, of course, so your textbook probably has some examples. So, for example, I could say, after 5,700 years, what percent of the original car carbon-14 remains? And I know, because that's one whole half-life, it will be down to 50%. And then it might say something like, it was detected in a sample that 25% of the original carbon-14 remains, how old is the sample? Well, 25% tells me that to drop down to 25%, we had to start at 100, 100 after one half-life drops down to 50, after another half-life, that 50 splits in half as well, so it drops down to 25%. So we're talking about two half-lives. One half-life is 5,700 years, so that sample is going to be 11,400 years old. For much older things, you might use something like potassium. The half-life for potassium is a lot longer and the larger these numbers get the less accurate you become but your margin of error just gets a little wider but we can still estimate something to be you know over a million or 100 million years old based on various samples so potassium half-life is 1250 million years old so anyways a really nice way to find out how old things are and it gives us a lot of evidence to when we dig up bones of our ancestors we can figure out approximately how long ago they were around so let's start to look at humans. Turns out humans are primates, and primates are an order of mammals. You remember the levels of classification using the acronym, it's not really an acronym, but King Philip came over for good spaghetti, right? King Philip came over for good spaghetti. Kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. So humans are primates which fit into that order of mammals other primates are and you've heard of these apes monkeys tarsiers lemurs primates comes from the word primo which means the highest order perhaps so what classifies primates as primates we have opposable thumbs and toes my toes are not really opposable but opposable thumbs we got fingernails forward facing eyes rotatable shoulder joints which i'm gonna go work out in the gym today yeah Color vision, some people lack that though. Skull modified for upright posture. Life in the trees. We don't really hang out in the trees anymore, but modified for life in the trees, I could climb trees if I want to, and I'm very good at that. If we take a look further down the classification chain of humans, if we take a further look down the classification chain, we end up at the family level, and in our specific case, we're talking about the family of hominidae. And 
These hominidae contain a couple of genera, and the two most famous ones are the Australopithecus and the Homo genera. The main features of this family are our bipedalism, ability to walk with two feet primarily. Currently, the only Homo genus that actually exists is our current one of Homo sapiens. Others that have existed included Homo habilis and Homo erectus and Homo neanderthalensis. The main trends, as you can see in this graph here, show an increase in brain volume and an increasing tendency to walk with two feet. In general, what we're seeing over time is an increase in diet quality and a correlation between an increase in brain volume as these different hominids came into existence. So there's a suggestion that it's the dietary energy, maybe increased eating of meat and proteins that actually helped for greater growth and uh, increase in brain size over time. You need to be able to recognize some trends of change as we look at the family of hominidae basically. And some various things are features of the bones as they change over time, the approximate time period that they existed. And before these particular species that we're looking at, there's one more from before that was called the Ardithopicus remedis, basically. And we only have fragments that exist as evidence, but they show some characteristics that are kind of somewhere in between uh, chimpanzees and the Australopithecus genera. So a few other trends we're going to see is a change in diet actually and habitat. So up here we're getting closer and closer to time where we're here at the Homo sapiens. This is what we recognize as a scary skull. So the mainly vegetarian diets all the way back uh, four million years ago. Grasslands started replacing forests. Diets shifted to include meat. That change in diet seems to show the strong uh, correspondence with uh, change in brain size. More protein in the diet, more fat, more energy supply has led to growth of larger brains. Catching prey becomes more difficult, so you have to be smarter, figure out different kinds of ways. You can't run as fast as some of these animals, so natural selection maybe is favoring greater intelligence, and larger brains are more capable of coming up with those kinds of intelligent plans and ideas. So. Those are the main trends we're talking about here. And then the relative locations, you need to know where they were so you can track this movement of these individuals around the world through evolution. So quite a bit of detail that you need to know here. So take your time with that. Make a little chart for yourself as well. It's important for us to recognize that we may have made too many conclusions on not enough evidence there haven't been that many fossils recovered. And every time a tiny fossil gets recovered, it could totally change what we understand about human evolution or relationships between different species. There are gaps in the record, uh, probably because early hominids didn't really practice burial rituals like we do, okay? So we it preserves the remains, I don't know, 200, 300 years from now, it's gonna be easy to go back and dig up go to cemeteries and actually find out about how what we were like because we've kept good records of everything as well too. And in the past, that wasn't the case. So that could be a problem. Paleoanthropology is considered a science because falsification is possible. If new evidence comes up, it could totally change our current theories. And we're willing to do that because we are scientists. Also, in the fossil record and carbon dating and using whatever types of radioisotope dating we have, we think that several species may have coexisted at the same time, Neanderthal man and Homo sapiens. We have survived and we are around so homo neanderthal man was not able to adapt so well we are going to end this session off with a short discussion of the differences between genetic and cultural evolution everything we've talked about so far has been about genetic evolution changes in gene and allele frequencies over time as homo sapiens we have some big brains and we know how to learn a lot of stuff we know how to record screencasts put them on youtube and try to have an audience or something like that. Language, tool making, hunting techniques, agricultural methods, religion, art, everything. This is all culture. We can pass it on on the internet and in books and everything like that. New methods, inventions, customs can be added. This is cultural evolution. And what we're doing now as cool or something is not going to be the same in maybe 20 or 30 years. So this changes quite a lot. 
genetic evolution is different because that involves natural selection between inherited differences. Cultural evolution is not related in that way. There's no affecting of allele frequencies. Changes can happen really quickly in one lifetime. Nature versus nurture comes up as well too, where nurture involves characteristics acquired during someone's life. Nature is what you've inherited through genetic evolution. So there can be some relationship there. People have more tendencies to do certain things than others because of their genetics, but that can be changed by the culture around them and the cultural evolution. So in the past few thousand years, we could say that cultural evolution has been really important, but probably not enough time for any significant genetic evolution to actually happen. Also, our curiosity for culture and science and studying medicine has helped us to develop medical technologies that have had an effect in actually reducing our genetic evolution. So that was a look at human evolution and Good luck with your studies.